privilege to read the Old Testament. This morning will be 1 Samuel 17, verse 4 through 16, and 48 through 51. If when you find it, if you can stand up out of the word. Then a champion came forward from the army encampment of the Philistines named Goliath from Goth. His height was six cubits and a span, and he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he wore steel armor, which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. He also had bronze graves, Greeks on his legs and a bronze saber slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the head of his spear weighed 600 shackles of iron, and his shield carrier walked in front of him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, why do you come out to draw up in battle formation Am I not the Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man as your representative and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight me and kill me, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. Then the Philistine said, I have defiled the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man so that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and very fearful. Now David was a son of the Ephraimite of Bethlehem in Judah. The man whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And Jesse was old in the days of Saul, advanced in years among men. The three older sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons who had gone into battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and the second to him, Abadab, and the third, Shammah. So David was the youngest. Now the three oldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's flock at Bethlehem. And the Philistine came forward morning and evening and took his stand for 40 days. Then Jesse said to his son David, take now for your brothers an effort of those, this roasted grain and these 10 loaves and run to the camp to your brothers. We're going to go to verse 48. And then verse 48. Then it happened when the Philistine came closer to meet David, that David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand into his bag and took from it a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead, and the stone penetrated his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with the sling and the stone. He struck the Philistine and killed him, and there was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath sleep and finished him, and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that this champion, their champion was dead, they fled. Read for you 1 Samuel 17, verses 4 through 7, uh, excuse me, 16, and 48 through 51. Let those that hear his word, live his word, and at this time we'll have Deacon Perry 
for the, uh, another Old Testament, Genesis 12, 1 through 9. Good morning, church. Good morning. Happy holidays. Once again, it's Genesis 12, chapter, first through the ninth verses. Let me just follow. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family and your and from your father's house, to land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And all you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham, excuse me, so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Moriah. And the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants I will give this land, and there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. And I read to you Genesis 12, chapter, first nine verse. That's the reading of the word. Amen. Amen. We <laughs> now have at this time another worshiping song by our musician, Sister Lucy Berry.
that's good right there, amen. Yeah. That's enough to get you thinking about some things. Yeah. About those things that you didn't tell God, but God already knows, amen. Yeah. What a good song, what great theology, amen, amen. Well, good morning, Fort Clark. Good morning, Fort Clark. In 2021, as we know, it has flown by extremely fast, and now we're into the December holidays. So it lets me know that we're actually in the season called Advent. Now, in the Baptist tradition, Advent isn't really highly promoted, but I do believe that it is a good concept for all faith communities. See, in the Baptist tradition, we call it Christmas or Christmas time, but others describe it as Advent. It's simply the season where we celebrate the coming of the Messiah. Yeah. Where we celebrate the greatest gift that the world has ever known. The greatest gift that the universe has ever known. It's a gift that was spoken so eloquently in John 3.16. Where it states, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but come on Christians have what yeah. everlasting life yeah. but we focus in on what God gave and that gift was Jesus yeah. that son Jesus is the best gift that the world will and has ever known yeah. now this time of year is usually filled with a lot of things hustle and bustle people trying to get to here and there People are actively shopping, looking for great gifts to surprise the ones that they love. And this year, there's extra expedience. You know, with the supply chain concerns, you want to make sure that that gift you ordered on Amazon is going to get here before and not after Christmas. Amen. So everyone is hurrying. Everyone is moving. Gift giving is a part of this season. Mm -hmm. But it's not all this season has to offer. Amen. See, the richness of the holiday is not merely found in a gift, but instead to a savior that came to earth to perform a job that nobody else could do. Amen. See, it's a job that took him away from the celestial regions and brought him down to lowly earth. It's a job that stripped him away from deity because nobody else on the planet could do it. Church Abraham couldn't do it. Saul couldn't do it. King David couldn't do it. The 12 disciples, they couldn't do it. It can only be accomplished by Jesus the Christ. Amen? And that's why I love him so, and that's why this time of year should focus on a celebration of Jesus and not simply the purchasing of gifts, not simply the Christmas parties, not simply the hustle and bustle of the season, but simply Jesus. Amen. Now, church, I ain't gonna lie to you. I do enjoy gift exchanges and the excitement that is associated with them. But it's just that every time or during this time of year, we can't overlook the gifts that are provided by our sin. We have gifts of love, gifts of peace, gifts of charity, gifts of soul satisfaction. See, these and more are provided by the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and that's why this time, Advent and Christmas, should want to structure us to want to do better and be better in Him. So for that, I just wanted to kind of look at some scripture. Some scripture for us to receive the full impact of what Jesus did for us. You know, first Him coming to earth, then Him taking on teaching and telling us about the things of heaven. Also, his death and his resurrection. I wanted to look at these things so that we can get outside of our comfort zones. Because sometimes there are things that we have to do in the name of the Lord that may make us feel uncomfortable. But through it all, God receives the greater glory. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to first turn to 1 Samuel. And we're going to look again at that 17th chapter. 
When you have it, please say amen. 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 And it's a very deep and in-depth chapter, so we're going to skip around a lot. We're actually going to go from the first to the fifth, then the 33rd through the 35th. So let us begin. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered at Shachath, between, which belonged to Judah, and pitched between Shachath and Azekah in Ephesus Dam. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched in the valley of Elah and set the battle array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose heights were six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head and was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, going to that 33rd. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he be a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. The servant slew both the bear and the lion, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. See, he has defied the armies of the living God. He has defied the armies of the living God. Now, church, this is a story I know many of you have heard from your youth. It's particularly a great story to talk with children because we have an epic battle between a giant of a man and a little boy. Mm -hmm. It's favored among Sunday school classes because it shows a battle between good and a battle between evil. See, yes, we are very familiar with this text in Samuel, but one thing that I have learned, that even though a text may be old and familiar, there are still new truths that can be found in that text and God reveals them to you every day. Amen. 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 So let us look to this text. See, from the reading, we find ourselves in the thrones of a great battle. On one side, we have the Philistine army, and on the other side, we have the forces of the Israelites. See, the text really sets the scene because it shows us that Israel occupied a hill and the Philistines occupied a hill and in between them was a valley, basically the place that they were going to do battle. Mm -hmm. I believe that Steven Spielberg and Martin Scorsese couldn't have directed a plot better to show us what an epic battle scene would become. Mm -hmm. Now, the champion of the Philistines was Goliath of Gath and he was a giant of a man. The Bible describes his height as six cubits and a span. Now, if we look at today's measurements, this means that Goliath was over nine feet tall. Now, to help you put this in perspective, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with Shaquille O'Neal, a basketball player, uh, played for the Lakers, played for the Magic, and now he's selling pizza for Papa John's. Amen. Right. <laughs> but Shaquille O'Neal is seven foot one. So imagine how tall Goliath was. He would actually look over Shaquille O'Neal. Almost a great two feet taller than the man we know who played basketball. So truly Goliath was a giant among men. Now this giant would walk out onto the field of battle. And he would torment the army of Israel. Because he knew that no Israelite man could even compare to him in his size and in his stature. He knew that Israel couldn't produce a champion such as he. But church, this is where I must interject and say, but God. You see, this mortal man thought that no force on earth could stop him. But he had not met my God. See, Goliath didn't understand that he wasn't going against an army of flesh and blood, but a spiritual army that was backed by the Alpha and the Omega. An army who called on the name of God, and God responded when they did. Yeah. See, he didn't recognize who he was dealing with. You see, because God had picked a champion for the Israelites, and his champion was a small boy who was tending flocks for his father. Yeah. So as the text progresses, we see that David is informed by his father to go to the battlefield to give his brothers 
provisions. See, David's older brothers were actually on the front lines fighting in the army of King Saul. So David goes and he obeys and as soon as he gets to the encampment, he hears the bellicose statements by the giant Goliath. He sees the, the state, he hears the statements and he sees the fear in the eyes of the men as Goliath speaks about someone coming down to fight him. See, I love the text because even though then they had words that you looked at that had to make you chuckle and had to make you smile. Because when David hears these things said by Goliath, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine defiling the obvious of God? See, in other words, he says, who the heck does this man think he is? We are the army of God. He can't talk about God like that. And y'all sitting up here letting him do it. Who does this Philistine think he is? Does this Philistine have the power to beat the army of God? See, I love David's tenacity and his belief in the Almighty. He shows us that when your back is up against the wall, that God is still in control. Yeah. That God still has your back. Yeah. Now, it's funny. When David's older brother heard David saying these things, he scolds him. He says, I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down just to watch this battle, to see somebody get killed. That's why you're here, David. Now, when looking at the text, I wonder why his older brother, whose name is Elihab, got so angry. See, to me, it's easy. I liken it to a person who had a rough day at work. And when they get home, they yell at their family, and they even go ahead and kick the dog. You see, they're really upset with what happened at work, and they bring their family and the poor dog into it. See, they should have taken care of the work situation and received resolution at work instead of taking that issue back to their household. Amen. See, a model that I've learned to live by, church, is just because you having a bad day doesn't mean I got to join in that bad day with you. Amen. So just because Elihad was upset, he was really upset is the fact that the army didn't take on the army of Philistines. That nobody would be brave enough to battle Goliath. So that is what really is concerned, but he took it out on Paul David. But David just kind of let it rush off his back because David again told people about what is this man, who does this man think he is? And in that conversation, there was somebody who actually sat at the seat of Saul. And basically they informed Saul that there is somebody who is willing to take up the challenge. Now, church, I'm not going to lie to you. Looking at a human eye, I know that these men must have been real desperate because you had men of all heights, none the height of Goliath. But when this little voice came, they said, oh, well, yeah, you can go ahead and be our champion. Go ahead, David. Go ahead and fight Goliath. So when he gets in front of King Saul, King Saul actually tries to dissuade him. And he says, now, you know, this man was a warrior since his birth. And you are just a little shepherd boy. But then David rolls down his resume. He says, yes, I did keep my father's sheep, but when a lion and a bear came to attack him, I dispatched him. And this uncircumcised Philistine is just like one of them. Right. Basically, he was saying, when a problem came before me, God was on my side, and God got rid of the problem, and God is going to get rid of Goliath. Yeah. See, this is the interesting part of the story. So Saul listens to David and agrees, and then he gives him his vestments. He gives him his armor. He gives him his sword, and he gives him his ephah. See, it's interesting because when David put on these vestments of Saul, he was uncomfortable, and he couldn't see his way to victory. So David removes these items. He takes off the armor. He puts down the sword and he takes off that afad and he goes into battle the way that is more comfortable for him. You see, this brings me, church, to a great point. See, when you need a problem solved, you must do it in the way that God gives it to you yeah. and not in the way that God gives it yeah. to somebody else. Yeah. You see, for somebody else, their breakthrough may be coming through advancing their relationship with God by prayer and by fasting. You may have done this without any resolution, but God informs you, yes, that's good, but you need to go ahead and make amends with your brothers and your sisters, and that's 
when no breakthrough is going to come through. You see, church, we can't always look at what others do to achieve goals in God. We have to allow God to move in our lives and make sure that we're doing it the way that he has for us. So David, with a small slingshot, a couple of stones, and a staff approaches the mighty Goliath. Now, Goliath sees this young man, and he says, now, if they're throwing sticks at me, do they think that I'm a dog? In other words, why did they send this boy to fight me? I am a warrior. See, this is where the word starts to get good. Because David said to this Philistine, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have to fight. Yeah. See, the interesting thing about the story 
is that it wasn't that, that they were offended. It wasn't that Abraham questioned. It's that Abraham equivocally followed God's instruction. Mm -hmm. See, he took his small family unit and moved into the land of Canaan. Mm -hmm. Now, church, could you imagine leaving everything that you knew? I'm sure you'd have some trepidation. I'm sure some fear would accompany this decision. Mm -hmm. If you were told to leave your family in Florida and move to Washington State, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure many of us would be questioning and saying, God, is this really what you want me to do? God, are you sure that this is the direction that you have for my life? Could you please, Lord, just give me a sign? Mm -hmm. See, yes, I understand that there must be the voice of God that informs you to do something as great as move to another state or move to another country. Mm -hmm. Because I never encourage anyone to make huge life decisions because a pastor, a Christian friend, or a YouTube evangelist told you to do so. Make sure it's the voice of God and then you go ahead and follow. Because if it's the voice of God, everything that stands in your way will move Every obstacle will be out and you will go forth in the name of the Lord. Yeah. So God instructed him to go forth. And in that he received a greater glory. A greater understanding was about to be made manifest and a great move was on the horizon. All he had to do was trust God and walk into the direction that God led him. You see, Abraham went into a land not knowing anyone and not knowing anything. But one thing that he knew for certain is that God was enough. Mm -hmm. He knew if God was great creator, that we also protect him in this foreign land. He knew that if God was allowing him and his family to move, that he wouldn't leave him and that he had a plan for his life. So from the red text, we see a young boy, a young boy who was fighting a great giant. We also see an older man who, in late in his life, takes his family away from the only home that they knew and followed the voice of the Lord. Now, both individuals did not know the outcomes of their actions, but they did know that whatever happened, that it served the purpose of the Almighty God. Even though David and Abraham had to do it alone, they went joyfully and followed the Lord. Now, I believe that we can learn from their examples. And I know that even though it looks like we're alone, God is still there taking care of us. Yeah. That if God is for us, we should follow him no matter where we or others feel like we should go. Yeah. So to give you a thought for today, on this last Sunday in November, I will go if I have to go by myself. Yeah. I'll go if I have to go by myself. Now, church, I love the word of God. Because whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, there's been someone in scripture who's experienced the same thing as well. Now, yes, their experience may not be identical to yours, but the theme of your shared circumstance will be the same. See, yes, the Bible may not speak about your illness. But there were people in the Bible who had illnesses, and look what God did for them. Yeah. Remember when there was a woman with an issue of blood who was healed from her concern, and a leper who was made clean and glorified the God of heaven. Mm -hmm. See, yes, the Bible may not speak to your financial situation, but I do remember a widow woman who had no more food in her house yeah. and was prepared with her son to die. Mm -hmm. But God brought a prophet to her doorstep yeah. and gave her yeah. the increase. Yeah. See, yes, the Bible may not speak about your family's concerns or problems, but there were a lot of dysfunctional biblical families. And look what God did in their lives. Yeah. And I'm sure, church, he will do it for you. Yeah. Yeah. So with that said, God gives us examples of resilience during a storm and courage under fire. He lets us know directly that this Christian life is not always easy. That there are tests and trials that will come our way. It's how we respond in these times that will allow us to grow and mature in him. 
Now, as seen in the life of David and Abraham, there are times when it's only going to be you and God alone. Now, I know that we say my friends are going to go with me. I know that we say my family is going to go with me. But there are some days where it's just you and God. Yeah, yeah, See, yeah. that means that somebody else might have been called for the task. That means that others might have been called to perform a duty. But they faltered and they gave up. Yeah. See, it's funny. I recall a movie where they had all of these men line up in a line. And they said, we're looking for volunteers, strong men, to do such and such task. And when the sergeant called for volunteers, everybody took a step back. And there was just one man sitting there looking around. <laughs> See, that's what happens sometimes. Basically, it feels like we're all alone. It feels like nobody's there with us. But I tell you, church, God is always by your side. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's times like these in Christian when there's a duty or a task that needs to be performed and nobody wants to step up, nobody wants to move. Sometimes it's just you making those movements happen. Yeah. See, we're definitely not speaking to us because when we get together, we make it all happen. Amen. Look at that turkey giveaway. Amen. Amen. But there are places sometimes where you might look to the right, where you might look to the left, where you might look up, you might look down, and there is nobody there to help you. But I'm sure when the call goes out and you respond, and you go forth that God is pushing you through and allowing your success to be made manifest. Yeah. Now, we can see it in our communities when there's a cry that goes out in the community and only a handful of people or only a, a handful of churches respond. Now, I'm not saying that every community need needs to respond, be responded to, but there are certain things that we must stand for. Mm -hmm. See, let us look at David. There was a whole army of Israelites. They were great warriors, and yet they could not respond to the task of dispatching the great giant, Goliath. None of them had the fortitude to rely on God and expect him to give them the victory. Church, we can't be like these soldiers. We cannot allow what we see to dictate what we know God can do. See, we can't allow fear to cloud our understanding and miss the move of God. We must be like David and call out those problems. We must be like David and walk in the expectation that with a few small stones and a shepherd's slingshot, he can beat a mighty delight. We must be like David and present ourselves to the Lord in a fashion in which we are comfortable. Not going to God like others, but going to God for our sins. We must be like David where we get fear out of our mind and allow a place of trust only to exist. Yes. Trusting in God and believing in God and acknowledging God as our resource, acknowledging him as all understanding and acknowledging him as our confidence. Yes. We have to recognize that when we get that close to God, he is our conviction. He is our belief and he is our reliance. Yes. He is a God of certainty. Meaning that if I follow him, it is certain that my outcome will be well. Yeah. It might take a week. Yeah. It might take a month. It yeah. might take a year. Yeah. But God will come yeah. forth. God will provide. You just need to wait on the Lord because he is yeah. your strength. Yeah. See, this is when our faith is placed in the Almighty. Yeah. When we get at this place of faith, it doesn't matter who's around us. It doesn't matter who's beside us. It doesn't even matter who's behind us. We know for certain that all of our help, all of our help, all of our help, all of our help comes from the Lord. And see, if our help comes from the Lord, then I must be steadfast and believe that he is going to come through. What if David would have walked up to Goliath, shaking and scared and seeing that armor and seeing that javelin, and there was even a person there holding a shield. And if he said, Lord, I, I think you got the wrong man for the battle. Yeah. There wouldn't have been no King David. Yeah. Right. There wouldn't have been all the stories that we talk about. There wouldn't have been that particular man after God's own heart. Mm -hmm. God would always raise up somebody else, but it wouldn't have been David. Right. So church, don't let it not be you. Mm -hmm. If God has set you up for a particular yeah. task, if nobody else wants to do it but you, go out in faith and trust God yeah. for the increase. Yeah. Right. Trust God that he's going to take care of you. Trust God that he's going to provide for you. Yeah. Trust God and allow him to see that you believe in him and if you believe in him, yeah. everything yeah. will be 
be all right. Trust God because he is your maker. Trust God because he is your provider. Trust God because he is your all and your own. That's the God we serve. And that's the God that's going to take care of you and take care of me. See, we can't allow what we see to cloud our judgment. We can't allow what we see to stop our knowledge of God. If Abraham had said, oh God, I think that's a great idea, but me and my family are comfortable here in terror, what would happen? He would, God, yes, I said, would have raised up someone else, but it wouldn't have been Abraham. I never want somebody else to do the thing that God called me to do. Because I want to make sure that the blessing that God has for me is for me. I don't want somebody else taking my blessing. So I'm going to do what God said to do. I'm going to walk where he says to walk. I'm going to talk how he says to talk. I'm going to do what he says to do because God is good. And God is always there. And if I trust in him, it will be okay. I'm never alone. He's always there with me. He's always there taking care of me. Because he is God. Now from these two Old Testament scriptures, we see David and we see Abraham. Both were men who knew the Lord. Both were men who trusted in what he had done and what he was doing in their lives. When it was time for them to walk in faith, they didn't hesitate. They didn't waver. They simply followed the direction of God. Church, we must aspire to be like these men. Not looking to others and not even looking to ourselves. Instead, looking to the triune God and following him no matter what we see. It's then and only then we can stand, not worried about others, not worried about who else is going to come along, simply knowing that if God will call for it, we will do it. And if we have to go, we will go all by ourselves. We will go all by ourselves. May God bless you. May God keep you. God we serve is an awesome God. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you, the little one said it best. Our God is awesome. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. He does so much for us. He can do so much more if we just allow him into our mind, our body, and our soul. Yeah. That's why this time of the service is awesome. Because you can give your hand to the pastor. Remember, the pastor is just a man. But you can give your heart to the Almighty God. Yeah. Getting to know him better. To understand what Abraham and David knew about the Almighty God. I tell you, when you know him for yourself, there is nothing like that. If you don't know Jesus as the partner of your sins, if you don't know him as your all in all, please today get to know him better. As we sing, search your heart. Try to know this. Please let Jesus come on. Will you please stand?
Amen. today. Thank you so much for coming forth. We do appreciate all our other home folk. Thank you so much. You are now family, so no more business. There are no other things that need to be said, and if nobody's mad but the devil, let us look to God for our benediction. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for everything that you've done. We thank you for coming in the midst of this body of believers and just blessing us all. God, only you can touch our soul. Only you can open our minds to your truth and your goodness. So we ask, God, that it's nothing that we forget, but something that we take with us as we go forth in this day. We ask that every family on the side of my breath continue to maintain safety and continue to be blessed in you. We pray that in Jesus' mighty name. Now to the one who can keep us from failing or falling, may his sweet peace rest full and abide with you and your family right now and forevermore. And let the saints of God say, Amen. 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 Amen.